Good Friday morning. I'm Joe Fryer. And I'm Savannah Sellers right now on Morning News Now. An ultimatum for tens of millions of American workers. Get the coronavirus vaccine by January or be subject to weekly testing. The new controversial workplace mandate issued by the White House. Plus, breaking news this morning, promising news from Pfizer on a pill that could prevent hospitalizations and even deaths from COVID-19. The results of a trial that has researchers excited. The 11th hour this morning, President Biden making a last minute push to get enough votes within his own party to pass two multi-trillion dollar spending plans. The new developments as lawmakers lay the groundwork for a vote. Courtroom controversy, protests on the streets of Georgia following jury selection in the murder trial of three white men accused of killing Ahmaud Arbery two years ago. It's very disturbing to find out that we had one African-American versus um, 11 whites. Why his mother says justice will still prevail as the trial moves forward. And on your marks, the New York City Marathon is back after last year's pandemic pause. The final preparations now underway and how this weekend's big event will look different than years past. And we are going to get that report from a runner who also happens to be someone you probably know, our friend Allison Morris. I think we're the only two people here who aren't running the exactly. marathon. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so. Maybe that makes you feel better as you're waking up. We wouldn't do it either. Exactly. <laughs> All right. We'll get to that a little bit later and see our friend Allison. But we begin with a major development in treatments against the coronavirus. This morning, the U.S. is one step closer to another pill that could prevent hospitalizations and deaths. Pfizer made the big announcement this morning saying the clinical trials for its COVID-19 pill are going so well, they're ending the trials early, hoping to get it to the public faster. Pfizer says the pill can reduce chances of hospitalization or death by up to 89 percent. This news comes as coronavirus cases drop nationwide. Right now, 45,000 people are hospitalized without COVID. That's a significant decrease from the peak of 123,000 hospitalizations back in January. For the latest on this new development, what it could mean for the future of the pandemic, let's bring in NBC News medical contributor, Dr. Kavita Patel. So, doctor, how significant is this Pfizer pill and help us understand how exactly does it work? Yeah, Joe, this is significant news, and it's on the actually back of Merck having submitted data to the FDA under review for a similar type of pill. This just tells us that we're going to have multiple options, which we didn't have before, even months ago. So this is a pill that you would take for people who are outside of the hospital within three days of mild or moderate symptoms and a diagnosis of, of COVID. So these are not people who are already sick. They're just mild symptoms. Could be a cough, fever, et cetera. Take it several times a day for... Uh, uh, it looks like it's up to a week to 10 days. I just need to double check that dosing. Bottom line, as you point out, though, 89% risk reduction of hospitalization and death. And this is significant news. I want to put a caveat, though. These were all unvaccinated patients. So this is important, but vaccination still remains the best way to avoid hospitalization and death. Yeah, I want to ask you about that. What's your message to folks out there who see this pill, see that it reduces hospitalizations and deaths, and then think they don't need to get vaccinated against COVID? Yeah, I say that because 89%, that's amazing. It's an incredible asset that we do need for people who are unvaccinated and get diagnosed. And potentially, Joe, down the line could be useful if we have breakthrough infections that still pose a threat. But again, it, it, it is nothing compared to getting a vaccine that prevents you from even potentially getting the infection in the first place or having to deal with these consequences. Let's talk about this new rule from the White House. It impacts roughly 84 million workers, two thirds of the country's workforce. Businesses have until January 4th to require workers get the vaccine or face weekly testing. If not, they face steep fines. What kind of impact do you think this is going to have on case numbers, especially since, you know, we're two months away from this deadline, which is in the winter? Yeah, huge impact, because I do feel like people, it's like taxes, Joe, I bet people will wait to the last minute if they haven't been vaccinated. So we'll probably see an incredible bump in vaccinations in late December, early January. But just the fact that this rule is out there is going to prompt many of the employers who haven't put these things into place to start doing the planning, and they already have as of yesterday. And that will respond, people, employees will respond. And, and remember, I think you pointed out that there's an option for weekly testing. Employers are 
are also going to have to think through the logistics on that and the burden of who has to pay for that. All those details need to be worked out. But even working out those details makes any employer think, really, I just want to get my population vaccinated. I'll do anything I can. They'll add into this, Joe, likely more incentives to get people who are unvaccinated to get shots in arms before January 4th. And finally, Dr. Patel, it's not just COVID. We're now in flu season. We know our best weapons yeah. against the flu and COVID are the vaccines. How do you know if you may have the flu versus COVID versus just a cold? Hard to know if you're at home unless you could have a couple of tools at home. One, some of those home antigen tests that we've been talking about for several months now, they're not 100%. So if you have a negative antigen test, I would still recommend if you're symptomatic to come in to a clinic or a pharmacy to get tested with that PCR test. But we also have those same rapid tests for the flu. And Joe, we are using them in clinic. We're using all three. We're using flu, strep. Uh, we're also checking for COVID with those rapid tests. So coming in and get evaluated because most of the times it's a common cold if you're vaccinated, but if you're not vaccinated, high likelihood it could be COVID. A time of year. All right, Dr. Kavita <laughs> yeah. Patel, as always, thanks so much. Appreciate it. Thank you. To Washington now and today could be the day congressional Democrats pass the president's economic agenda. The House plans to vote today on those multi-trillion dollar bills that together would invest in the country's social safety net and also improve the nation's infrastructure. These potential legislative wins for Democrats are coming on the heels of losses in Virginia and a tight race for governor in New Jersey. The president is hoping to change political tides before the 2022 midterms. Let's bring in NBC News White House correspondent Monica Alba. Monica, good morning. Always great to have you. So last night in the House, the Rules Committee passed through the Build Back Better Act. That's the $1.75 trillion social safety net bill. First, let's listen to a little bit of that. I appreciate the gentleman wanting to slow the process down, but I can assure him that this has been a slow and painful process uh, that has gotten us not to this slow point. Enough, not uh, painful uh, enough. Uh, but as, as uh, <laughs> and I'm sure you will do all you can to. Uh, my friends will do all they can to make it more painful before we get to the you finish can, line. You, you can count on it. But I will also assure the gentleman, as he knows, that uh, this cannot become law and uh, it will not move forward in the Senate um, without a CBO score. All right. So while that exchange did get some laughs, I mean, this really has been a drawn out process for Democrats. How is the White House looking to land this plane finally? It's been months of negotiation, Savannah, with the president going to Capitol Hill twice to try to rally his own party to get behind his multi-trillion dollar spending bills. And it finally appears today may be the day that both of those get one step closer to becoming reality. When we talk about the bipartisan infrastructure deal, remember that already passed the Senate back in August. So the House is expected to advance that today, send it to the president's desk for signage, which means it could become law in the next couple of days. That will be a very significant accomplishment for this White House. They're very eager to have that behind them. But then this other piece of legislation, the $1.75 trillion social safety net and climate plan, is a far bigger hurdle to tackle and get through because there are still some outstanding issues as we compete here with the morning <laughs> landscaping crew, Savannah. But I can tell you the president overnight was engaged, making calls to some of these holdouts, trying to get them to be on the same page. And the fact that there are votes today, something we haven't seen throughout this whole process, is quite significant. Competing, Monica, and winning. You didn't miss a beat. So now how much of a shot in the arm would it be for the White House if the House is able to pass these bills? This would be monumental for the Biden presidency. This is something that candidate Joe Biden campaigned on his Build Back Better agenda. There was so much that he tried to promise and see what could be accomplished. And realistically, with such slim majorities in the House and Senate, the president always talked about this as an uphill battle and really something that he wanted to get done. He was the eternal optimist in all of this when many people said it doesn't look like this is going to be able to come together. He was the one who said, I think I can get my party behind it. But again, the huge question remains for this other multi-trillion dollar plan Major senators like Joe Manchin have not signed off on it yet. There are still some big sticking points on immigration, on prescription drug prices, and still on how exactly to pay for it and how that will all get put to bed. So it will come back to the Senate. It will be debated. And now in terms of the timeline, they're looking at Thanksgiving, but realistically, this could slip closer to Christmas when you know, Savannah, there are already other deadlines to consider, like the debt ceiling and government funding.
Yes, we'll be back to that round two on that one coming up soon. Now, Monica, let's put a bench to this also just in context with what's going on. I mean, the president's approval rating has just fallen. Democrats lost in the Virginia governor's race, nearly lost New Jersey's. How could these bills shape the White House's approach to the 2022 midterms? Last week, behind closed doors, President Biden told House Democrats that this week could essentially determine his entire presidency, what happens in the House and Senate. And I think in large part, it wasn't just because of what might happen with his agenda and these bills, but also because of the Virginia and New Jersey races and, of course, those disappointing results for Democrats throughout the country. So there are a lot of lessons that the White House is taking away, though the president argued that even if these things had passed before Tuesday, maybe that wouldn't have made much of a difference. It's hard to know, but he is using those losses to try to boost some of this momentum, which now you're seeing actually result in action on Capitol Hill. So the White House is going to argue this is what voters want. This is what the American people demand. So they're going to want to tout all of this and what they were able to accomplish and hopefully they believe get over the finish line in the next couple of days as a major, major talking point going into 2022. But the big thing we should remind people is the party in power typically does lose seats during those elections. All right, Monica Alba from the White House for us. Thank you so much. Today, a grateful nation will pay its final respects to former Secretary of State Colin Powell in a funeral service at Washington National Cathedral. The retired general broke barriers as the first black chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Powell served in various roles under four presidents, both Republicans and Democrats. He died of COVID-related complications last month at the age of 84 while battling a rare blood cancer. You can watch his service at noon right here on NBC News Now. This morning in a Georgia courtroom, opening arguments will begin in the murder trial of three white men accused of killing 25-year-old Ahmaud Arbery. Arbery's supporters are already questioning whether justice will be served after only one black juror was seated among the 12 selected to decide the case. NBC News correspondent Ron Allen is outside the courthouse with more on this. Ron, good morning. Good morning, Joe and Savannah. This is a case that ignited a storm of protest across the country. And this morning, the family of Ahmaud Arbery finally gets their chance for justice in court. Anger and calls for justice outside a Georgia courthouse after only a single black juror was selected to help decide a racially charged case that ignited protests across the nation. Nearly two years ago, family members say 25-year-old Ahmad Aubrey was jogging through a mostly white neighborhood when he was allegedly chased, shot, and killed by three white men. Gregory McMichael, his son Travis, and a neighbor, William Roddy Bryan, faced nine counts each, including murder, aggravated assault, and attempted kidnapping. They've all pleaded not guilty. I'm very anxious about the trial beginning. I'm very hopeful that we'll get the, the correct verdict. Aubrey's mother insists the verdict should be guilty on all charges and life in prison. When you heard about the jury composition, what did you think? Um, it was very disturbing to find out that we had one African-American. Do you still think you'll get justice, whatever that means to you? I do think with the evidence that the state has that we will get justice for mine. In a county that's about 26 percent black, with hundreds of potential jurors questioned, the defense used its legal challenges to dismiss all but one black juror. The judge stunning the court with this statement. This court has found that there appears to be uh, intentional uh, discrimination. But he added Georgia law prevents him from taking action because the attorneys gave reasons other than race for the dismissals, like insisting the prospective jurors could not be impartial. I think the judge went by the book and the problem may be the book. The defendants are expected to argue they were making a citizen's arrest of a suspected robber and acted in self-defense, while prosecutors insist Aubrey was an innocent black man murdered. I uh, anticipate that it's going to be really contentious. In a way, the, the central facts are not in dispute and they are caught on videotape. It's really two very different worldviews. The judges told jurors the trial should last two to three weeks with Aubrey supporters and advocates who say this is a test for racial justice in America watching closely every day. Joe, Savannah. All right, Ron Allen, thank you so much. The White House is pushing back this morning on reports that families separated at the border during the Trump administration would be entitled to payouts of several hundred thousand dollars. Let's listen to what President Joe Biden told a reporter. 
So this is a garbage report? Yeah. Okay. So $450,000 $450, per person. Is that what you're saying? That was separated from a family member at the border under, under the last administration. That's not going to happen. Okay. NBC News Justice Correspondent Julia Ainsley joins us now. So, Julia, the president's comments come as negotiations are ongoing between the Justice Department and lawyers for the families that were separated at the border. Do we know why the president is pushing back? Was this just a case of that, that reported settlement number just being too high? Well, that's what the White House is saying. We saw Corrine Jean-Pierre yesterday brief reporters at the White House saying that he was just taken aback by the number. But what it seems and what we're hearing from lawyers representing the families is that the president really wasn't briefed on these internal negotiations happening between the Justice Department and those lawyers representing the families. It's important to remember this isn't every immigrant family that's crossed the border. This is a very small section. This is the parents and children of 5,600 5, who were separated in 20 2017 and 2018 by a deliberate policy of separation under the Trump administration. And their lawyers believe they're entitled to compensation because of the trauma they went through. Now, when we reported last week, we understood that those figures were still in negotiations and that they're about in the hundreds of thousands of dollars per person mark. The Wall Street Journal reported on that specific $450,000 mark. But it seems that the president was taken by surprise and wanted to push back. Again, it may just be that he didn't understand what was happening internally in this one negotiation. It's, it's not very common for the president to be involved in anything like that, let alone to be briefed on the specific number that could easily change. So, Julia, let's talk more about the families. What are their lawyers saying about the president's comments and then what happens next now in the negotiations? Well, it did have an impact. We understand that on Wednesday evening, shortly after those comments, Joe, that the lawyers of the Justice Department reached back out to the lawyers representing the families and said, look, we're not going to get anywhere near that high of a number. And so now they're really upset. They're thinking that the president basically opened his mouth on something he didn't know about. And as a result, these families are going to have far less compensation than they think they deserve. But the negotiations are ongoing, and they could always go back to court and have a judge weigh in on how much they should be paid. Now, on top of that, the Washington Post is reporting that at least 25 Republican senators are attempting to block any payments to those separated families. What kind of action are, are they planning to take? You know, it's interesting. The amendment that these senators brought up, and this was being led by Ron Johnson of Wisconsin, this is to try to block payments to all immigrant families. So it could, in theory, have an impact on these families. But it seems that they're really using this moment as a political punching bag, saying, look, not only is this administration letting in immigrants, now they're paying them for their trouble. But what we have to remember is this is, again, a very specific set of immigrants who went through a very specific trauma that was deliberate at the hands of the previous administration taking children away from their parents without any system to track them or reunite them. In fact, over 1,000 still remain separated. But yes, there is an amendment. There's a Republican push in Congress right now to try to block any payments to immigrant families and, and to try to have an impact on this as well. But of course, this is a court negotiation, um, and it's not clear that the amendment in Congress would really have an impact on that. It's a trauma that you and Jacob Soboroff have reported on extensively, and we appreciate your reporting. Julia, thanks so much. Let's now get a check on your morning news now weather. Michelle Grossman is in for Marathon Man Bill Karens. <laughs> Michelle, good morning. <laughs> In Marathon Man in so many ways, besides <laughs> yeah. just the marathon on Sunday, but <laughs> so happy to see you guys. Happy Friday. And once again, we're talking about the cold because it's still here. It's going to be in place tomorrow as well before we see a little bit of a rebound. So here's your freeze warnings, freeze advisories, where you see that hot pink. That's your freeze warning. And 28 million people still impacted by this on this Friday morning. We're going to be below average in so many spots. All that blue on the map indicating some really cool air in place. So Gainesville, just 62 degrees today. That's 14 degrees below what is typical for this time of year. And then we're going to kick off the weekend. Lots of soccer games, football games for the kids. And it's going to be a cold one on the sidelines. Uh, temperature is well below normal once again in the southeast. Tallahassee just 64 degrees. We're also watching a rebound. That's good news by Sunday. So speaking of the marathon, looking pretty good on Sunday. But a lot of us back into the low 70s, even upper 70s in Charlotte by Tuesday. Back to you guys. All right, Michelle, thank you so much. Coming up, the lasting impact of Donald Trump in the world of politics. In the last 24 hours, you said the 2020 election was stolen. Would you have certified Arizona's results? Hell no.
After the break here on Morning News, now hear from two GOP contenders in key swing states on how they hope to push the former president's agenda forward in the midterms. After Republicans pulled off a win in Virginia's gubernatorial race this week, both parties are looking ahead to 2022. Multiple governor seats are up for grabs in key swing states next year, and the influence of former President Trump looms large. Yeah, NBC News correspondent Von Hilliard spoke with two candidates who are on the ballot next year, and if they win, it could have an impact on the 2024 election. I think the America First movement has been the most important political movement in this country. This is Carrie Lake. She is at the heart of this story, a candidate for office in 2022 who could throw the U.S. into election chaos in 2024. In the last 24 hours, you said the 2020 election was stolen. Would you have certified Arizona's results? Hell no. Carrie Lake. Whoa. Lake, a former Phoenix local news anchor, caught Trump's attention over the summer. Wow. This could be a big night for you. She is now Trump's pick to be Arizona's next governor. This is Trump eyes his own 2024 comeback. He already has a following of candidates like Lake, who refuses to say that she would have certified the 2020 election. How close to a constitutional crisis were we? I think we came very close to a constitutional crisis. Trump pressured current Arizona Governor Doug Ducey last year, but Ducey did not back down, even silencing a call from the White House as he officially signed and certified Arizona's vote for Biden. Governor Ducey was horrible. He was missing in action. Now Lake is looking to replace him. Doug Ducey should have never certified that. But it's not just Arizona. It's Georgia, Michigan, Nevada, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin. All these swing states have races for governor in 2022. Those states' governors in 2020 all signed off on their state's results. But in 2024? Many of those people those heroes of our democracy in 2020 will be gone in 2024. In Georgia last year, Trump called on the state's Republican governor, Brian Kemp, to resign after he, like Ducey, made Georgia's Biden win official. Then, less than a week later, on the morning of the January 6th insurrection, Donald Trump has just begun. I'm a part of his team, and we're going to take back this country. That man, Vernon Jones, a Georgia legislator taking to the stage in Washington in defense of Trump. He is now running for governor. He's a great guy. He's smart. He's tough. Vernon Jones. I stand for free, fair, and transparent elections. If you were to win the governorship, why should one trust that you would certify the election results in the state of Georgia in 2024 if Joe Biden were to win a re-election or another Democrat? Well, see, that is your narrative. That's what you want to push. But what I am saying to you— But you're not even willing to say that you would certify the 2020 election. I will certify anything that's legal. Some states also require the sign-off of their secretary of state. Trump trying to influence here, too. In Arizona, backing Mark Fincham, a state legislator who is also outside the Capitol on January 6th, and supporting Jody Heiss, who is trying to beat Brad Raffensperger in Georgia. Lake is already making campaign stops. To my second Curry Lake event. This week, Lake throwing what she calls an election integrity rally. November 3rd, we witnessed that steal go down. Multiple reviews in Arizona and Georgia found no major voter fraud that would have impacted the outcome, but no mention of that here. In 2024, would you be willing to put the country into position potentially of a constitutional crisis by not certifying Arizona's results? In 2024? If you were governor, that would come down to I you. Think, I think we need to, let's just take it slow here and, and get through decertifying. I think we need to decertify our election right now. I don't want to look into hypotheticals. But still, next year's governor's races with ripple effects for the 2024 presidential election. Let me ask you, Vaughn, would you certify a crooked, corrupt election? Would you certify a crooked, corrupt election? Just to make peace. Yes? No? That's not how I operate. I do what's right. That was Von Hilliard reporting. So what happens if a governor were not to certify election results? Well, there really isn't a clear answer, as it depends on the state's statutes. This is likely to be a story we'll be following heading into the 2022 midterms. Fight over redistricting in the battleground state of Michigan is taking center stage this morning. Despite an amendment designed to keep politicians out of the process, 
NBC News has obtained a series of recordings showing a coordinated effort by some Republicans to influence the independent commission tasked with drawing district lines. NBCNews.com senior reporter Jane Tim broke the story. She joins us now. So, Jane, you talked to Michigan Republicans for this story. What did you find they were doing to try to influence the commission? Yeah, so Michigan Republicans, party officials, and, and conservative groups focused on redistricting all said what they want is fair maps that give them a good shot to compete in the elections. But behind closed doors, in Zoom trainings, two of which I have observed, uh, we see a slightly different argument, that we see them advocating for specific changes uh, that experts tell me essentially lines up with how the GOP has previously gerrymandered the state. So really relying on county and city lines to, to continue continue the, the, the gerrymander that was enacted previously. So the Michigan's redistricting is all done independently by a commission. This is the first year that it's being done, and they're given us lists of qualifications, things like keep districts of equal size, protect communities of interest, uh, partisan fairness, and they're ordered. And what we see the GOP doing and encouraging their voters to go to these independent commissions and testify in favor of is, is things like keeping their whole county together and even casting it as what they call a community of interest, which is sort of an elusive term, but in the end, and what we're seeing experts say that advice they're giving their supporters to do would really help the GOP to, uh, do better in state elections. So after you initially published your story, you learned Michigan Democrats held a training session of their own. What about that? Can you tell us? Yeah, so when I talked to Michigan Democrats before uh, publishing this story, they had said, you know, we're not running trainings like that. You know, we have conversations with our voters, and we'll help them workshop talking points if they want. But as it turns out, there are a couple of county-level trainings that did happen. One in Kalamazoo had four people, and no one wanted to testify after the fact, whereas Republicans were able to mobilize some supporters, for sure. Uh, and what we're seeing is that it sounds like Democrats may have sort of dabbled in this, but just weren't nearly as successful in it as the Republicans have been. Uh, I spoke with a former GOP chair who said, you know, it really isn't uh, bad per se to be doing trainings like this, but it's what you're saying and what you're doing in those trainings that matters. So in the middle, then you got the members of the Independent Commission in charge of redistricting. What are they saying about these revelations? Are they doing anything to make sure the commission stays free of influence? Yeah, so this commission, these commissioners are, are interesting people because they're chosen by lottery, which is a really unusual thing in politics. You apply to be on this commission and then you're chosen. There's four Democrats, four Republicans, and five independent or unaffiliated voters. Um, and I asked a Republican, a Democrat, and an unaffiliated voter, well, what do you think about this? And, you know, they said, you know, we're not totally surprised. We do sometimes hear scripts that show up at these public hearings to testify and, and try and urge us one way or another. But they said our constitutional mandate is our constitutional mandate, and that's what we're going to do. Oh, lottery. Interesting. It's like political powerball. All right. Jane Jim, thanks so much. Appreciate it. <laughs> thanks, Joe. Let's now take a look at what's making news around the world this morning. Raf Sanchez is with us this morning from Tel Aviv. Raf, good morning. Joe Savannah, good morning. The West African nation of Niger is going into two days of mourning after at least 69 people were killed in a suspected terrorist attack earlier this week. No group has claimed responsibility for the attack, which took place near the border with Mali, but an ISIS affiliate is known to operate in the area. In Scotland, a snow patch known as the Sphinx has melted away for only the eighth time in 300 years. The mountain patch typically stays frozen even during the summer months, but it melted as Scotland plays host to the COP26 summit, where world leaders are trying to curb the worst effects of climate change. And finally, a sister is doing it for herself. The Pope has appointed a woman to the number two position in the governorship of the Vatican. Sister Raffaella Petrini, a 52-year-old nun, is the first woman ever to serve in the post, which is kind of like a deputy mayor. That's progress. But guys, remember, priests cannot women rather cannot serve as priests, cardinals, or popes in the Catholic Church. Right. Raph, thanks so much. Appreciate it. Thanks, Raph. And coming up, the New York Marathon back on track after COVID canceled it last year. But there will, of course, be some changes for runners this weekend. We'll show you how this year's race will be different next on Morning News Now.
The National Toy Hall of Fame has three new members this year, and odds are high you've played with one of them. American Girl Dolls, The Board Game Risk, and Sand. Yes, no. sand. No. We're all inducted based on their influence in the toy industry. Not the a addition toy. of sand into the Hall of Fame may raise some eyebrows, like for Savannah, but the group said it Thank was you. perhaps the most universal and oldest no. toy in the world. Now, full disclosure, I was actually on the Toy Hall of Fame induction <laughs> committee this year, which means are. I voted. We had to pick from this list of 12 toys that were nominated, and of the three that were inducted, Savannah, I voted for none of them. Oh, good. I did not vote for any of those you three. You know how to I pick them. I definitely did not vote for Sam. Wait a minute. What did you pick? <laughs> I voted for uh, American Girl Doll is great. I actually voted for Cabbage Patch Doll. Okay. Which to me was like more iconic. I agree. More my childhood. I agree. More classic. I voted for Pinata. I think Pinata oh. was a good one. And I voted for He Man, Masters of the Universe, because that's my jam. I got all the figures. Uh, yeah. The cartoon. I still have them. I that's love it. That's my thing. I did not jump on the sand wagon. I just am like, it's just not a toy, simply. It's, I mean, maybe it's I, like a component in toy and maybe yeah. you are entertained while building a sand castle, but that doesn't make it a toy. Right. Yeah, I, I agree, but big controversy this year. Yeah, whoo. Thanks, Joe. Hard hitting there. <laughs> right, thanks. Now, this weekend, the New York City Marathon is back after COVID canceled last year's race. When runners head out on Sunday, a couple things will be different than they used to be, including fewer runners than the usual 50,000 plus. But there will be a familiar... Face on the course this weekend. That's NBC News Now anchor Allison Morris. There she is. She's running her seventh New York City marathon, and I'm opening up a text from her to say her 19th marathon total, which I just I'm shook by. Allison, good morning. I have so many questions about how you've even done that, but let's start with the marathon. It's going to look different than the ones that you've run in the past. So tell us how. What are organizers doing to keep people safe, especially because of COVID? Yeah, there are a couple of COVID changes this year for sure, Savannah. Uh, one of the biggest things is, is that all runners need to show either proof of vaccination or proof of a negative COVID test within 48 hours of the race. Runners are going to be wearing masks on the transportation to the starting line. They'll have to wear them at the start on the Verrazano, Verrazano Bridge, uh, but we won't have to run in masks. Uh, so that's a little bit of a relief. Yeah, wow. There are going to be more starting waves this year, five instead of four. Uh, those waves will be separated by about 45 minutes instead of the typical 20. Runners love that. Makes a little bit more room on the course. Mm -hmm. The Jacob Javits Center, which is home to the Marathon Expo this weekend, will not be open to the public. Runners have to make an appointment to go pick up their bibs. They pick a, a window and they're going to show up. You can bring one person along with you, but that's about it. And probably the biggest change this year is the field. As you mentioned, there are typically 50,000 plus runners at the New York City Marathon. This is the biggest marathon in the world. We're expecting around 33,000 uh, this weekend, bringing a whole lot of energy though so don't worry the city is going to feel alive and exciting there's there's no doubt about that yeah absolutely i mean it's a sign of normalcy it's going to feel like it used to you know so oh, yeah. to speak and allison so okay oh, yeah. you're obviously a huge runner you're also of course our business extraordinaire here so let's talk about the economics of this i mean <laughs> thousands so of people coming into the city this weekend that i would think is going to be a big boost tell us about that side of marathon marathon weekend Oh, this is huge for the city, no doubt. Whether there are 33,000 runners or 50,000 runners, people come here. This is a major event. We've been watching tourists run by all morning long. They come and stay in our hotels here. They eat in our restaurants. Let me tell you, they show up at the Marathon Expo and buy a whole lot of gear. <laughs> runners come to this city not only to run the marathon, but to have a vacation, have a good time, and spend uh, some money. I caught up with the New York Roadrunner CEO, Karen Hempel, earlier this week. The Roadrunners put on the marathon, and she talked about what an incredible impact the New York City Marathon has on this city economically. Take a listen. It's really an important aspect of the race. I mean, we do um, economic impact reports after the race and have seen um, over uh, $400 million of economic impact, whether it's from um, the hotels, the airlines, the um, restaurants, the, the shopping that people kind of fly into. Often this is, people make this into a long vacation, um, especially coming from overseas or even domestically um, as a real kind of destination bucket list item and really building a trip around it. So, Savannah, even if they don't get the $400 million that they typically get, even if they got half that, it's a huge economic boon for the city, uh, and no doubt uh, we could use it after all we've been through here. Yeah, absolutely. And all we've been through really together, I mean, for a year and a half, isolation, it's been so, you know, yeah. dark. It's been a tough year. I know running has been so important for a lot of people's mental health, yeah. in addition, of course, yeah. to physical health. Just tell us kind of what it means to you to get to be able to be back out there again in a group like this doing something that you love. Oh, 
<laughs> Savannah, I have to say, and I think a lot of runners would agree, signing up for the New York City Marathon and running again, I took a break during the pandemic, has absolutely saved me. It has been the joy of my life this fall. I am, you're going to make me cry. I'm uh, uh, famous for crying at the marathon, during the marathon, before the marathon, at the end of the marathon, and just being here at the finish line. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a marathon crier. It, it just makes me so emotional. It's such a wonderful thing to see back in the city, uh, and it also helped me get rid of a, a couple of those pandemic pounds. So thank you, New York City Marathon, for bringing so many of us back to life. Oh, absolutely. You're going to make me cry because you're so happy. It's so exciting, and you're just so cool. 19 marathons. Look at your gold jacket. I mean, Allison, who are you? Good luck. We can't wait to hear about it. We love the you. The official 50th marathon jacket. I love it. That's so cool. Love you guys, All too. Right. <laughs> we'll see you Thanks, after. Savannah. <laughs> Turning now to a major headline in the sports world, besides the marathon there, Green Bay Packers quarterback Aaron Rodgers benched this week after reportedly testing positive for COVID. This morning, questions are mounting about Rodgers and if he's been violating NFL protocols. NBC News Now correspondent Maura Barrett takes a closer look. New questions swirling over NFL star Aaron Rodgers about whether he broke the league's COVID rules. The quarterback sidelined this week after multiple reports that he tested positive for COVID-19. He was asked directly whether he had gotten the vaccine before the season began. Are you vaccinated and what's your stance on, on vaccinations? Yeah, I've been immunized. Um, you know, there's a lot of uh, a lot of conversation around it, around the league and a lot of guys who have made statements and have made statements, owners who made statements. Um, you know, there's guys on the team that haven't been vaccinated. Uh, I think it's a personal decision. I'm not going to judge those guys. But ESPN reports the NFL has been treating Rodgers as unvaccinated since the beginning of the season. Rodgers has not returned NBC's request for comment. By the NFL saying he is out for this game, that was the code word for the fact that he has not been vaccinated. The Green Bay Packers announced the quarterback cannot play this Sunday because of NFL COVID protocol guidelines, which means he'll sit out for 10 days. I went, wait, they're clearing, they're calling him out already? And that's when I started to go, wait, does that mean he's not vaccinated? The NFL does not require players or coaches to be vaccinated, but if a player does not get a shot, NFL protocol says those players must wear masks inside team facilities, get tested daily, and wait 10 days before returning to play after a positive test. The final score and, and also... But if Rodgers is unvaccinated, he seems in violation of rules. He's been without a mask at press conferences and also on the sidelines at games. If he is found to have violated these policies, will he face any consequences from either the team or the NFL? He will face some financial consequences, but they're not severe. He can be fined $14,000, and that, that players can be fined up to $50,000 for these transgressions. The NFL released a statement late Wednesday saying the primary responsibility for enforcement of the COVID protocols within club facilities rests with each club. The league is aware of the current situation in Green Bay and will be reviewing with the Packers. The team quiet after reporters pressed the head coach on Rodgers' initial comment about being immunized. Do you feel like a goal like that might be seen as misleading to the fans? It's a great question for Aaron. I'm not going to comment on it. As Maura Barrett reporting, Rodgers is the second Packer this week sidelined by COVID on Tuesday. Practice squad quarterback Kurt Benkert tweeted his diagnosis and was placed on the reserve list. Over the summer, the NFL announced if a team has a COVID outbreak among unvaccinated players and a game cannot be rescheduled, that team subject to a forfeit. And coming up, it's that time of year to turn back the clock. We'll tell you how you can make the most of that extra hour this weekend. Plus, a warning for Tesla drivers after thousands of cars are recalled over brake issues. When we return on Morning News Now. If you're planning to take a cruise this holiday season, you may need your vaccine card, plus a smart device to test air quality and Bitcoin at Burger King. NBC News investigative and consumer correspondent Vicki Wynn has all that and more in this week's Good to Know. 
Hey, good morning. Happy Friday. We start with an alert from Tesla. The car maker is recalling nearly 12,000 vehicles after it says a software issue may activate emergency brakes unexpectedly. Tesla said it has since updated the software and owners can check the company's website to see if their car is part of the recall. Don't forget your vaccine card on your next cruise. Norwegian Cruise Lines announced it's extending its 100% vaccination policy indefinitely. All crew and passengers must be fully vaccinated two weeks before departure and show proof when boarding. What's in the air? Amazon unveiled a new smart air quality monitor. The $70 device pairs with Alexa. It will alert you during elevated levels of dust, pollen, carbon monoxide, and other toxins. How would you like some Bitcoin with that burger? Burger King partnering with Robinhood to give away free cryptocurrency. Through November 21st, customers have a chance to win Dogecoin, Ethereum, or Bitcoin when they spend $5 on the Burger King app and join the restaurant's rewards program. For News Now, I'm Vicki Wynn, and that's good to know. It always is. Thanks, Vicki Wynn. Now it's time for our CNBC Money Minute, the biggest financial headlines of the day and why they matter to you. Bertha Coombs is with us this morning. Bertha, good morning. Hey, good morning, guys. Happy Friday. Apple is dropping mask requirements at many of its retail stores starting today. Bloomberg reports Apple is easing rules as COVID cases decline and vaccination rates have risen. Face masks for customers, vaccinated or not, will no longer be required at more than 100 of the 270 Apple stores here in the U.S., with more being added in coming days. Employees will still have to wear masks, as will customers in areas with local mask mandates. Meantime, shares of Peloton, that was the big winner during the pandemic. Remember, everybody wanted a bike, everyone bought a bike because they couldn't get out. Well, shares are tumbling today, wiping out about six or $8 billion rather off of the company's market valuation. Demand for Peloton and exercise bucks, bikes and treadmills, as you can imagine, is slowing. The company executives say it's clear that they underestimated the reopening impact on business Rising vaccinations and easing COVID restrictions have encouraged a lot of folks to go back to the gyms, hitting Peloton's growth and boosting earnings of chains like Planet Fitness in the meantime. And Uber is bringing back carpooling in an attempt to tackle higher prices. Uber Pool was shut down uh, back at the big start of the pandemic due to you know the potential risk for infection. And it's remained shut even as vaccines have become available and customers have returned. But Uber prices are up about 20% compared to a year ago. The company CEO Dara Koshoshahi says introducing a new pool service will keep uh, basically help ease demand for Uber's main products. Hopefully, it also will help bring prices down more so folks could be carpooling again. I didn't do that before the pandemic. Nope, and not doing it now. All yeah. right. <laughs> Somebody you don't know, you're trying to get somewhere, yeah. do you talk, do you not? Ugh, I don't know. All right, hey, Bertha. You never know. You never know who you could yeah, meet. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> All right, thanks, Bertha. <laughs> <laughs> the weekend is almost here, and this one will be an hour longer than usual. That's because we're falling back on Sunday night as daylight saving time ends. Well, longer weekend is always welcome news. The change can still pose problems for getting a good night's sleep. Joining us now is sleep specialist Dr. Carol Ash. Dr. Ash, thanks for being with us. So I know this time change can actually be a challenge, especially for parents with young children. My best friend was just talking about her baby's schedule and what's going to happen. What can we do to try and ease this transition? Well, Savannah, it is a real challenge for parents and kids. And, you know, there's a recognition that the switch back and forth from daylight savings time and then in the fall to falling back wreaks havoc on our health and safety. And with young kids, their brains still aren't developed yet. So there's even greater consequences to them. The stress of that switch causes inflammation in, in kids. It can cause them to have difficulty with school performance and can even cause uh, car accidents and those young teenagers that are driving and kids that even might be struggling with, with, with addiction. It increases addictive behaviors and not, you know, obviously substance abuse, but even just eating more food than we should be eating. So it's mm. a real problem. So, mm -hmm. so, oh, go ahead, doctor. Go ahead. Okay. So what you want to do is really recognize these issues, and this is a great time to reset good sleep behaviors. Kids need routine and control. They need a regular bedtime schedule. They need a relaxing routine. It's about 20 to 30 
before sleep at night. And then, you know, adhering to putting that clock back, but not doing it until you're ready to get into bed. So you gain that extra hour of sleep. So when we fall back, it's actually better for your health. Very quickly on this last one, losing that sunlight can sap your energy. What's a great tip to avoid feeling sluggish? Well, you want to get out. Again, the reason daylight savings time is so problematic is it, it, we get elimination of that bright sunlight in the morning. So get as much sunlight as you can. And you want to even get out, walk, exercise during the day. The sunlight and the activity are great for re reversing the effects of fatigue and helping to keep you alert during the day. All right, Dr. Carol Ash, thank you so much. Great tips. Coming up, he is a leader in tech and a millionaire at just 25 years old. In college, a lot of times kids learn how to be adults with others their age. But in my situation, I did not learn that way. When we return, I'll share his success story and how he broke into the business at such a young age. At just 17 years old, Michael Saman started working for Facebook. Now at 25, he's a veteran of the tech industry and a published author. But his dream started far, far away from Silicon Valley with a simple Google search. I sat down with Michael. Here's what he told me. I get an email on my iPad from Mark Zuckerberg's assistant. I thought it was a, a fake. When Michael Saman was just 17 years old, he was hired by one of the largest tech companies in the world. For three years, Michael led teams with people nearly twice his age, pushing them to create features like Instagram and Facebook stories that would appeal to people his age. I always thought, well, Mark Zuckerberg and, you know, Facebook, like, they're not going to listen to a kid. Then you see the products come out and you see billions of people using these things and thinking, wow. But Michael's journey to Silicon Valley success started way earlier than his senior year. Today, Apple is going to reinvent the phone. It started with the launch of the first iPhone. I watched the presentation on the internet that Steve Jobs gave about the App Store. And one of the things that he said was that anybody could make an app. I totally bought it and I decided to go on the internet and look it up. Yes, look up how to code. And just two years later, this self-taught coder submitted his first app to the App Store when he was just 13 years old. When the first check from Apple came uh, that first month um, uh, for $5,000, uh, my mom immediately turned to me and said, like, very concerned, uh, where did this money come from? <laughs> yeah, then the, the, the second check was almost 8000 and then more and more. Yeah, I was like, excuse me, you know, let me pinch myself. <laughs> Your 13-year-old is making that. Yeah, and for me it was like, you know, this is something from God that is helping us me through my son. At that time, the family finances were in a tough place. His parents' American dream, a Peruvian restaurant they opened when Michael was three, had been struggling, and they were worried about getting evicted from their home. So the big checks Michael was bringing in with his apps went to help keep the family and the business afloat. I remember at that point thinking, you know, I can't rely on my parents for everything. You made what, almost $200,000 from your apps, and your mom comes to you and says, how are you gonna pay for college? Yeah, I remember that. I I was shocked. I, <laughs> I was like, wait, what do you mean? Um, what about all the money from the apps? And uh, she told me, what do you mean, what about the money? We needed to use it for the payments and all the things. Michael had one hope, an internship with Facebook. He'd been invited to apply after one of his apps was included in a presentation seen by Mark Zuckerberg. So instead of heading off to a college campus, Michael went to Facebook's, where he parlayed his summer internship into a full-time job and a new life in California. In college, a lot of times kids learn how to be adults with others their age. But in my situation, I did not learn that way. I had managers, directors, executives taking care of me. Now at 25 years old, Michael's a millionaire, still working in tech and hoping his story will inspire others, especially other young Latinos.
I didn't think too much about the realities and the improbabilities of the world that we live in. I kind of just was naive about it and decided, oh, well, I can do it. But I think that mentality is what helped me get there. There's so much more on that point about Latino representation and those tough financial conversations with his family in the book. Of course, I had to ask about the recent news out of Facebook. Actually, Michael said he wasn't surprised by all the scandals that have come out of the company since he left in 2017, since Facebook, now called Meta, of course, is really a first of its kind in many respects. And he added that not everyone in the company is going to have the best intentions, but a lot of people that he met there do. So interesting to hear just all the backstory of that, too. Yeah, absolutely. Googling how to code, and there we go. Great interview. All right. <laughs> Thanks. That does it for this hour of Morning News Now. But the news continues right now. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.